Good morning, everyone. I hope you have a night, a good night of rest. Uh, I would like to give some practical information for the for the day and for tomorrow. So the village conference is closing today. So if you haven't had a chance to to visit, so there is a slot at 1 to 2 p.m. today. And uh, there is a mini conference from Kevin Burns uh, at 1 p.m. And there is also a photo booth, a photo souvenir with uh, your colleagues. If you want to do with uh, Island Biology, you can print your pictures. So please, ha you, can, you can have a, a try. And there is also the photo exhibitions. I don't know if you, some of you have time to, to go visit the photo exhibitions, one on the Eparsis and Antarctic Islands, and the other one on the insects. So it's on the two places, I think, There's on the library and the main faculty of science, the entrances are, are free. So you can go any time in the day when you have uh, the chance. And the Arboretum, we have an Arboretum called the Cade Arboretum on the campus. It's native and endemic trees that were planted. So there are two visits organized by our students at 9.30 a.m. and at 3.30 p.m. The meeting point is at the inform information desk at the entrance of Amphibioclim. The students will be waiting for you there. And for the best poster, I hope everyone had the chance to vote for the best poster of the Monday session. It closed yesterday at 11. So today again, we will be running this competition uh, for the best poster of the day. So please go on Vox Vote and enter the code 93137 to be, uh, to be able to access the, the vote. And tonight there is a social event organized by IRD and, um, and RFI, um, RFI, sorry. But it's, it's, it's called EPOP uh, for e-participatory -particip uh, observers project. So it's young, it's young people, students mostly, but I want to, um, to question older people from the island to see if they saw any changes about climate change. So they will be um, uh, showing some short movies about, about that. So it's, unfortunately it's, in fr it's French, so people who are French speaking uh, would, uh, would, would uh, also English speaking would have access, but know that it's in, in French. Um, the time is 5.30 to, to 7, next to the Amphi Bioclim, next to the Chapiteau, and there will be like small appetizers and drinks as well uh, during this time. Uh, you can register online at this, uh, at this link. For the field trips tomorrow, uh, departure is at 8 a.m. from the university, so you will have uh, normal shutters from downtown, to come to the university. When you arrive here, please go fetch a lunch bag uh, at the Chapiteau where we have uh, lunch and uh, go, go down to the main avenue of the campus where the buses will be numbered and you can just access the, the bus. The, the buses come back around four, between four and five and we drop you directly to, to, to town. For the marine field trip, the conditions are not so good for tomorrow. Uh, windy, um, so we, we're maintaining the field trip, but be aware that there may be not, you will not maybe be able to, to snorkel. This is it. Have a good morning, and I would like to call Paolo Borges to introduce our next speaker. Thank you. Uh, I have the pleasure today to present Tim Blackburn. Uh, Tim Blackburn uh, started his career as a macroecologist. I uh, had the honor to be a PhD student at Imperial College when he was starting as a uh, postdoc of John Lawton uh, many, many years ago. Uh, uh, it was uh, exciting moments where Macroecology was starting, growing. Uh, he and Kevin Gesson made a fantastic team uh, putting together and uh, growing macroecology. When we think on, uh, on Team Blackburn, we think in three things. Macroecology, of course, birds, 
and invasive species and islands, of course. I think uh, he made a fantastic uh, work in uh, putting uh, these, at least, birds, islands, and invasive species as an important research topic nowadays. And one of his last contributions, the adaptation of IUCN framework to invasive species, is also a very interesting uh, recent avenue of his uh, research. I think uh, we will be uh, very, it will be very interesting to see his presentation. And uh, now there's that invasive species is one of the most important problems on islands. I think this is a very uh, timely uh, talk. Thank you. Uh, good morning, everyone. Uh, thank you very much for uh, coming uh, so early in the morning. Thank you very much for inviting me to be here. So today I'm going to talk about um, some work that is sort of falls pretty much at the intersection of the two main interests from my career that uh, Paolo just mentioned, so the intersection of macroecology um, and invasion biology. And so my talk is uh, titled The Island Biogeography of Alien Species, um, but actually probably more accurately, um, why are there so many alien species on islands? Um, perhaps an appropriate talk for somewhere like uh, Reunion, uh, which is uh, so beautifully invaded. So there's four parts to my talk, so I'm going to kick off with some background um, so that we're all sort of singing from the same uh, hymn sheet throughout most of the talk. I'm then going to introduce a, a general model for alien species richness that um, has been developed in collaboration with some colleagues. Uh, I'm then going to look at some of the components of that model um, and how they might uh, relate to the alien species richness of islands. And then at the end, I'm going to actually sort of come back to the beginning and actually ask, well, actually, do um, islands uh, have more alien species? So uh, let's kick off with some background. So as Paolo just said, I started off my career as a macroecologist. Uh, and I uh, studied macroecology because I was interested in understanding patterns in the sort of species richness, diversity, uh, of uh, ecosystems around the world. Um, and so we see across the globe a fantastic um, array of natural diversity. Um, some areas have lots of species, some areas have few species, but all of that um, sort of species diversity is ultimately driven by just three processes. So the number of species in an area can increase because of speciation, uh, it can increase because of immigration, um, and it can decrease because of extinction. And then there's a whole range of ecological, environmental, evolutionary factors um, that act uh, to determine the interplay of those three processes and give us the number of species that we see in different areas um, around the world. So that is, has been the case for most of the history of the Earth. Uh, but in the last uh, few centuries at least, uh, we're now seeing a situation where those evolutionary and ecological factors are being superseded uh, by another factor, um, and that is us. So the impact of humans um, on uh, these, uh, these diversity processes. So typically we think of this in terms of the impact of humans on extinction. So humans um, have uh, impacted on the environment in a number of ways. So we harvest uh, species for uh, food and other uh, natural products. We uh, cut down habitat and we convert it into areas for agriculture. Uh, we are pumping all sorts of um, unnatural, um, in inverted commas, elements into the environment in terms of pollution. Um, and all of those things together are uh, heavily impacting extinction rates. So extinction rates currently are estimated to be between 100 and 1,000, maybe more, times greater than the natural background level um, in the fossil record. Um, and this is sort of driven by the fact that the human population is um, increasing uh, quite dramatically. However, it's not just um, extinction that humans are, um, oh sorry, um, and that means that we have um, lots of species um, that used to be present um, on this planet, um, you know, even up to just a few years ago, uh, but have now gone um, globally extinct. <coughs> 
But it's not just extinction um, that humans are affecting, we're also affecting um, this other diversity process, uh, immigration. So as I guess uh, most people are aware, humans um, are thought to have evolved in Africa um, and then spread out from uh, that continent to colonize all other parts of the world, um, sort of starting somewhere between sort of 75 and 150,000 years ago, such that um, now humans have essentially colonized every um, ice-free um, area of the planet. And as we've spread around, uh, we've taken other species with us. So here is the first example, or, or the earliest example we know of, a species that um, has been moved uh, by humans uh, to an area where it doesn't naturally occur. So this is um, a species of marsupial, the gray couscous. Um, it was moved from um, its native range in New Britain here to this island, New Ireland. Um, and that happened around about 20,000 years ago. Um, so people have been moving uh, species around for a long time. And these species that people are moving around are what we call aliens. Now, I'm sure that um, most people here will know what an, an alien species is, but uh, just so that we're clear, um, it's a species that's not naturally present in the flora or fauna of an area, but it's been moved to that area, which is beyond the limits of its natural uh, geographic distribution by human actions. And some of those alien species uh, spread across the environment, in which case we call them invaders, um, and others don't. And there are many synonyms for aliens, which I may slip into using by mistake, um, but we may call them exotic or non-native, sometimes introduced. Uh, but these are, are all referring to the same thing in the context of this talk. And so pretty much anywhere you go in the world now, you're going to encounter alien species. Uh, so here we have um, a few examples. I was out with my camera uh, yesterday just around the campus here. Um, and there's a range of, of uh, species that you can find on this campus that are not uh, native to this area. So things like the uh, red-whiskered bulbul uh, and the uh, Indian miner uh, from Asia, uh, the Madagascar turtle dove and the, this sort of zebra dove here. And so um, this slide is also to remind me that um, although this uh, is a talk about alien species, as Paola mentioned, I essentially work on birds. So the vast majority of the examples here um, are going to be about birds. Um, and that makes sense anyway, because um, birds are both the best group to study um, and the group with the, the best data for the kinds of questions that we're interested in here. But in fact, of course, it's not just birds um, that are alien. Uh, essentially, every taxon uh, that there is has uh, species that have been moved to areas where they don't naturally occur. Um, and the rate at which uh, this process is happening uh, is increasing dramatically. So this is some work I did with um, Hanno Siebens and other uh, colleagues uh, looking at um, a data set that Hanno collated uh, which relates to uh, more than 40,000 uh, specific introduction or sorry, uh, naturalization events, so the establishment of alien species. Uh, it refers to more than 16,000 species from a whole range of taxa all around the world. Um, and where we have uh, dates for those introductions, what we see is, so this is in the, the period 1500 to 2000 um, AD. So for most of this period, we're sort of getting around the world a few uh, new uh, alien species uh, populations establishing uh, until around the middle of the 19th century, at which point the, the rate of species um, establishment starts to increase, and then it increases again uh, in the, the second half of the 20th century. So over most of this period, we're getting around about half a dozen, sort of six or seven, sort of new alien species establishing um, around the world every year. Um, but this has increased until uh, in the sort of the late part of the, the last millennium, uh, we're essentially seeing more than one new alien species established somewhere around the world every day. Uh, and I should point out that this is not a cumulative uh, curve, uh, this is the, the new alien species established every year. Uh, so this is uh, a rapidly increasing trend, something that we may uh, want to worry about. But when it comes to alien species, uh, not all areas are equal. So some areas end up with more alien species than others. So here we have uh, a map of the global uh, alien species richness for birds. Uh, the hotter colors, the reds and the oranges, um, are areas that have lots of alien species. 
uh, and the paler, uh, the, the cooler colors, the blues, uh, these are areas uh, with uh, very, relatively few alien species, and the grays are areas where we don't have any records of alien species currently uh, in that area. So you can see that there are some areas that really sort of stand out as being richer in alien species than others. So then the question is, uh, why is this? Well, one of the first people to think about this, and certainly uh, the person who uh, popularized um, the, sort of the study of alien species, uh, was Charles Elton. And, and he published a classic uh, monograph in 1958, The Ecology of Invasions by Animals and Plants. Um, and Elton's book um, is sort of really heavy on examples of alien species. Uh, it's kind of quite light on um, hypotheses and analyses. Um, but if you go through it, you can find some statements by Elton uh, for some of the reasons he thought that um, some areas were more susceptible to alien species than others. And this essentially comes down to the idea that um, areas that are relatively simpler in terms of their uh, biotic communities are going to be more likely uh, to get incursions by um, alien species. And two of the big um, hypotheses that come out of, um, of that observation um, is that the natural habitats on islands, particularly small islands, seem to be much more vulnerable to invasion than areas on continents. Uh, and also that areas in the tropics um, are going to be much less uh, vulnerable to uh, invasions than areas at higher latitudes. Uh, and this all comes down to the, the complexity of the ecological communities in these areas. So in the tropics, there are lots of species, complex communities. They're not going to be so easily invaded. Um, on islands and at higher latitudes, they're relatively simpler communities, um, less resistant to invasions by uh, alien species. And if you look at the uh, global map for alien bird species richness, um, that would seem to, to bear this out. So areas that are rich uh, in aliens uh, are often islands, Taiwan, New Zealand, the UK. Uh, and areas that are relatively poor in alien species uh, tend to be sort of continental regions. And, and the tropics uh, particularly seems to uh, not have uh, many alien species at all. However, when we think about alien species and the development of alien uh, faunas and floras around the world, what we need to understand is that an invasion by an alien species is not a unitary process. It's actually a sequence of processes that a species has to pass through to go from being a native in its own distribution, minding its own business, to being an alien invader rampaging across a, uh, an environment where it shouldn't be uh, causing all sorts of problems. And, fail, and species can fail to be an alien because they fail at any of these stages. So the first way in which a species can fail to become an alien is it just doesn't get translocated, so it doesn't get moved outside its native range to a new area. So uh, just using the cartoon of, um, of invasions in New Zealand, so this species of honey eater, for example, uh, it's not an alien invasive species in New Zealand, but it's never been uh, translocated to New Zealand, so uh, we wouldn't expect it to be. Species can be taken to areas outside their range, um, but they can fail to become an alien if they are essentially not introduced to the environment in that area. So in the case of birds, for example, if they don't escape from captivity. So you, you, know, you can go to places around the world, you can see lots of uh, species that are not native to that region, but they're in zoos, they're in pet shops or whatever. Um, they're not being introduced, so they can't become an alien um, invader. So a species can be translocated to an area, it can be introduced into the environment, but it can still not become an alien if that population that's in, or those individuals that are introduced fail to establish a viable population. So here's one example. Uh, the uh, New Zealanders uh, back in the 19th century attempted to uh, establish populations of uh, the linnet on New Zealand. They introduced uh, several populations. Those populations all failed. So there's no alien populations of linnets established on New Zealand. However, they did the same thing with kookaburras, laughing kookaburras, uh, translocated from Australia, introduced into New Zealand, and those kookaburras have established um, a small, uh, viable, persistent population up in the uh, north of the North Island here. So the kookaburra is an alien species in New Zealand. It's established alien 
We don't class it as an invader because it hasn't spread widely. So it's, it's, it's established a population, but it hasn't really spread uh, far beyond uh, that uh, point of introduction, at least so far. However, there are many other species in New Zealand that we would consider um, invaders because they've uh, been introduced, they've established, and they've spread widely. So here's just one. Uh, this will be a common, uh, an obvious, a well-known species to people from Europe, uh, the um, dunnock here. It's been introduced and spread widely, and there's hardly anywhere in New Zealand now where dunnocks um, don't occur. And there's no way that that species would have got uh, to this place naturally. So the realization that um, invasion is a, a series of, a sort of sequential series of processes um, has two consequences. So the first is that we actually need to study each of those processes separately to understand the invasion process. So technically, we need to consider success and failure at each of those uh, introduction stages. So transport, introduction, establishment, and spread. The second consequence is that each of the stages essentially acts as both a filter and a pump for subsequent stages in the process. So most species around the world don't have alien populations, and that's because they get filtered out at the earlier stages, so they're not translocated um, or they're not introduced to the new environment. However, those species that are introduced, then that becomes the pump for the subsequent stages. So when you want to understand establishment, what you need to understand is uh, the features of species that are being introduced. So this sequential process um, means that you have to think about um, the invasion process uh, in a set way and essentially consider drivers of establishment, introduction, and so on. So drivers of each of these individual processes. And then it's the integration over all of these different processes uh, that gives you the characteristics of your alien flora or fauna in an area. So that's the background. Uh, let's then consider um, alien species richness. So when we published a couple of years ago this map of um, alien bird species richness, we, we started to try and think conceptually about um, sort of models for alien species richness um, in a given area. Uh, and in this paper, uh, we suggested that um, you can think about alien species richness in this way. So, so R is your alien species richness. And so essentially, the, the alien species richness of an area, um, like the, the island we're on, for example, is then a function of how many species are being introduced to that area, which we call uh, colonization pressure, or S, uh, minus the number of uh, those introduced species that fail, and then plus uh, the number of species that spread into that area from elsewhere. Now, we weren't the first people to think about um, alien species richness in, in a conceptual way, so, so about 10, uh, 20 years earlier, uh, Lonsdale, um, had published a, a conceptual model where he thought about um, alien species richness in a similar way, but essentially it was the number of species that are being introduced, your colonization pressure, uh, multiplied by the probability that um, those species succeed or the proportion of those species that succeed. So Lonsdale wasn't considering uh, spread, and actually that's not unreasonable because for many areas around the world, um, we don't really need to consider spread. So isolated islands, for example, alien species or most alien species introduced to those islands won't spread uh, to other areas beyond them. And in fact, even on continental mainlands, at least so far, most alien species um, have not spread very far. So, for example, the, uh, the average native range size for an, um, a bird species is just under a million square kilometers, around 870,000 square kilometers. Uh, for established alien populations, uh, it's just over 10,000 square kilometers. So around about one, one degree grid square um, on the Earth. So most alien species have not spread uh, very far. And a lot of the diversity uh, or you know, these areas that have alien species in are because of those few species that have spread uh, quite a long way. So anyway, we uh, took Lonsdale's model and then we um, built on it by um, starting out by uh, expressing it in a slightly different way. So like Lonsdale, we're essentially ignoring spread, so we're just considering closed systems. 
Um, and then we rewrote his equation so that the alien species richness of an area is then simply the sum uh, of, uh, across the number of species that have been introduced to that area of the probability that each of those species establishes a viable population there. So it's simply sigma pi uh, between one and the number of species that have been introduced. So then what we need to do is we need to consider uh, what determines the probability uh, that a species establishes a population. And what's very well known is that um, this depends uh, on two things. So one thing it depends on is the number of individuals that are introduced to an area. So in conservation biology, for example, we worry about small populations because those small populations are quite likely to go extinct um, just by chance, even if the environment is um, supposedly good for them. And the same applies to alien species. So small, very small populations of alien species uh, are also quite likely to go extinct. So in aliens, we tend not to worry about that. We tend to worry about the larger populations that don't go extinct. But essentially, the number of individuals that are introduced is really important. So uh, then uh, this equation was uh, first written, I think, by Brian Lung. Uh, but he's basically making the point that the probability that a species establishes a population uh, depends on the probability that an introduced individual survives to leave uh, a surviving lineage um, to the power of the numbers of, of individuals that are introduced. So essentially, a population is more likely to establish if individuals in that population are more likely to leave a uh, surviving, uh, surviving lineage and there's more individuals introduced. Now what we know is that um, those introduced individuals, they can either be introduced all in one go or they can be divided amongst lots of separate introduction events. So we can extend this equation slightly by uh, dividing it out between the numbers of introduction events for a species at a location and then the numbers of in individuals in each of those events. And dividing those individuals into different introductions potentially has consequences for the likelihood that that population will establish. But then that gives us this equation for the probability that a, a population will establish. And then all we can do is we can combine this equation with this equation to give us um, our general model for alien species richness. And so this model um, has essentially three components. So it has colonization pressure, the number of species that are introduced to an area. It has propagule pressure, which is uh, the sum of the number of individuals introduced per introduction event across all the introduction events that occur. And then it has the probability that um, an individual introduced will leave a surviving lineage, which we call our lineage survival probability. And so just these three uh, broad components uh, are driving uh, alien species richness, we think. And one obvious consequence of this model is that a lot of the factors that are driving alien species richness in an area come down to what people are doing. Because people are um, deliberately or accidentally introducing the species to an area, so they're determining S. And they're also deliberately or accidentally determining propagule pressure, the numbers of individuals that get introduced. So all of the things that we typically think about as potentially driving the richness of an area, so all these things like the, the traits of the species, the characteristics of the location, um, this all comes down to our lineage survival probability. So what this model is immediately suggesting is that humans are going to be the dominant factor in determining the alien species richness of an area. So then what we can start to do is we can start to put numbers into our model and see what the consequences of playing around with uh, those numbers are. So th the first thing we did was we, um, we parameterized the model uh, assuming that we have 100 individuals introduced to an area, 10 introduction events, each of 10 individuals, and then a lineage survival probability of 0 0.005. And if you do that, then the expectation is that you should get around about 40 species established in that area. So then we can start to play around with the values of these parameters and see what the consequences are. So here we have sort of doubling, trebling, quadrupling, and up to a multiple of five times 
uh, each of these uh, individual parameters separately. So the first thing to note is that uh, if you double, treble, or whatever, the number of uh, introduction events, the numbers of individuals per event, or the probability that those individuals survive to leave us a, a lineage, those all have essentially the same impact on the number of alien species in an area. So the in increasing all of these um, factors essentially increases the likelihood that a species that you introduce will establish a population, and so that increases your expectation for the number of alien species uh, that are present in an area. However, in increasing all of these factors can only ever increase that number up to uh, an asymptotic level, which is uh, set by the number of species you're introducing. However, if you double, treble, or whatever the number of species you introduce, then that really has a, a significant impact on the number of species that you uh, expect to establish a population in an area. So it seems that colonization pressure, this number of uh, species introduced, is the key factor uh, driving alien species richness uh, in an area, at least in this simple uh, model. Now, we can go a little bit further. So we, we can introduce heterogeneity into this lineage survival probability. So what we expect is that the probability that individuals uh, leave a surviving lineage uh, is going to vary from area to area. So not all areas are going to be uh, equally good for uh, those species being introduced. And so we can model uh, heterogeneity. What we find when we do that uh, is that um, heterogeneity essentially increases the likelihood that introduced populations will fail. So essentially, regardless of how many individuals or, or number of introduction events you're putting into an area, if that area is bad, then it's quite likely that all those individuals, all those introduction events will fail. So adding this heterogeneity increases failure rate. But it doesn't increase it equally uh, for all of the different parameters. So it turns out that if you have heterogeneity, so if some areas are good and some areas are bad, or some times are good and some times are bad, then it actually makes sense to divide up your introduction amongst lots of different events. So if you have 100 individuals, it makes sense to introduce them as 10 different introduction events rather than putting them all in one basket and introducing all 100. Because if you put all 100 into an area that's bad, then all of those 100 are going to fail. Whereas if you divide them up into 10 different introduction events, um, you increase the probability that one of those introduction events is going to coincide with an area or a time that's good. And so that's going to then um, increase the likelihood that, that that would succeed. And we kind of see this here in the, this separation out of, uh, of the number of individuals from the number uh, of events. So putting all your eggs in one basket is bad uh, if the area that you put them in uh, is then going to mean that they all die. So when we introduce this, uh, this heterogeneity, um, what we find is that for a given uh, lineage survival probability, so a given probability that one of those individuals is going to leave a, um, um, a surviving lineage, uh, then when you've got heterogeneity in the environment, um, you tend to get uh, lower alien species richness, so fewer of those introduced species um, will persist. And what that implies is that then regions with low environmental heterogeneity might be easier to invade. And of course, that has considerations for areas like islands, which we tend to consider as relatively stable, um, homogenous environments where there's not much heterogeneity. So all else being equal, our model might suggest that um, islands may be more amenable to alien species because of this lower um, heterogeneity in the environment. However, um, before we sort of leap to that conclusion, what we actually need to do then is consider how the different components of this um, alien species richness model may vary uh, for um, islands versus areas that are not islands. So let's now consider um, the components of this model. And let's start out with uh, colonization pressure, so the number of species that are being introduced to an area. Now, when we look at our um, global study of bird alien species richness, um, and we model this in terms of a number of different um, predictors for uh, variation in species richness, what we find is that by far the largest component of the best model for alien species richness 
is the number of species that you introduce. So if you introduce lots of species to an area, you're going to end up with lots of alien species uh, in that area. So this uh, suggests that, um, as we saw in our model, that colonization pressure term is going to be uh, absolutely important. Uh, there are other anthropogenic effects on alien species richness for birds. So the longer people have been introducing species to an area, the more alien species it has. Uh, the closer to a historical port that area is, the more alien species it's going to have. Um, and interestingly, in terms of uh, non-anthropogenic uh, drivers, what we find is that controlling for all these other um, effects, the more native species an area has, the more alien species it has too. So areas that are good for native birds also tend to be good for alien birds, um, all else being equal, which kind of goes against this Eltonian idea that um, more complicated or more complex, richer areas are going to be more resistant to um, alien species incursions. This effect um, is also uh, true if we just uh, focus down on islands. So here we have um, a set of islands um, around the world. So the, the circles here are real data for birds. The triangles are a, a model that you don't have to worry about. But essentially what we see is that for a set of islands around the world, the more species that are introduced to those islands, the more uh, alien species are established on them. And actually sort of depicting it in this way kind of starts to give you an idea of why we would expect this relationship anyway. So in the absence of spread, which is going to be the case for lots of these islands, um, there's an upper limit on the number of species that can become established on those islands, and that limit is set by the number of species you introduce. So essentially there's a big area of parameter space here that is off uh, limits uh, to uh, this particular data, and therefore you're almost certainly going to get a correlation between the number of species introduced and the number of species established just by chance. It's what we call a spurious correlation, because essentially you're plotting x against x plus y. Um, in this situation. If we actually look at this in a, in a more of a classic island biogeography way, so this is the same data that you just saw. Uh, we have our species area relationship for, for these islands, so the number of species established um, against uh, area. Um, here's uh, the native species for those islands. Uh, this line uh, is for the introduced aliens, and this line is for the um, established aliens. And you can see that the number of alien species established on these islands is more or less a constant proportion of the number that you introduce. Um, in fact, uh, colonization pressure explains almost 90% of the variation in alien bird species richness across these islands. So the number that you introduce uh, is a clear driver of the number of alien species that you end up with. So then the question is, well, maybe alien uh, species are richer on islands because there are more species being introduced to islands, and crudely, uh, that would seem to be the case. So uh, my group is actually involved in a, a proper uh, analysis of colonization pressure, but I just hoiked out um, a couple of the data columns from that um, analysis uh, just to look at whether there are more species being introduced to uh, island regions than to mainland regions. Uh, so we have about 4,500 dated bird introductions uh, in this 500-year period. We have 90 island regions and 208 mainland regions, and we're actually seeing more um, alien bird species being introduced to the island regions than to the mainland regions. So this would suggest that um, colonization pressure is indeed higher uh, on island regions than on mainland regions. So that's one component of the model. What about um, propagule pressure? Well, theoretically, we know that um, founding population size ought to influence the probability that a population establishes uh, in an area. Uh, and the data for alien bird introductions show that that is true. So here we have a set of several hundred uh, alien bird introductions. So here we have establishment probability against founding population size, the numbers of individuals introduced to an area. Uh, so a population either fails, in which case it's across down here, or it succeeds, in which case it's a cross up here. And then we can sort of average, we can bin them and sort of take averages of success in different bins, which are these um, black circles here. And what you can see is that um, there is a, a, a sort of an asymptotic relationship between establishment success uh, and the numbers of individuals you're introducing. So when you're introducing um, a, relatively a relatively small number of individuals, certainly sort of below 50, 
uh, then there's a reasonable chance that those populations will fail to establish. However, once you get above, certainly above 50 individuals, then essentially um, that population will either succeed or fail in a way that is then independent of uh, the numbers of individuals that you're introducing. So as in conservation biology, very small populations are likely to fail, and this is highly likely to be uh, due to chance effects, uh, environmental stochasticity, demographic stochasticity, um, alley effects. But once you uh, exceed um, that uh, danger area, then success depends on other things. So propagule pressure does matter in terms of establishment success. And it's not just for birds either. So this is a meta-analysis of studies of propagule pressure where we can uh, um, extract an effect size from the analysis. Um, what these studies are doesn't matter, but essentially uh, what you can see is that uh, propagule pressure is a consistent positive um, effect on the probability that a population will um, establish worldwide. We can then use these studies to try and understand heterogeneity in the effect size, so what determines whether propagule pressure is a strong effect um, or a, um, a less strong effect. And essentially what we find when we do that is that there's relatively little that explains any variation um, in, this, in um, the effect of propagule pressure, at least in the, um, the data that we could put together. So there's a tendency for univariate analyses to find a stronger effect of propagule pressure than multivariate analysis. There's a tendency for propagule pressure studies in animals to find stronger effects than plants. Um, but other than that, we essentially find uh, very little going on. So there's no effect of scale, how big the area is. There's certainly no effect of island versus uh, mainland. Um, and there's also no difference between propagule size or number. So it doesn't matter uh, whether you're dividing up your individuals into lots of populations or not, uh, in, at least in terms of the strength of the propagule pressure effect. And in fact, if we think about um, how propagule pressure might be driving island alien richness, uh, then what we find is that, at least for birds, uh, propagule pressure tends to be less or lower on islands than it is on continental areas. So overall, propagule pressure matters. Um, its effect varies, although we don't exactly know why most of that variation occurs. Um, but it's, that doesn't seem to be um, a potential explanation for why we get more alien species on islands, because propagule pressure tends to be less on islands, at least for this one data set where we have um, good data on propagule pressure. <clears throat> so then we have this third component, lineage survival probability. So the probability that an individual introduced to an area survives to leave a um, lineage in that area. And if we think about uh, what it is that may determine whether that individual introduced to an area leaves a founding, uh, leaves a, a population there. Generally what we think about are two broad sets of features. So we tend to think about characteristics of the species, so traits of the species that might make the species a good um, invader or good at establishing a population. And then we tend to think about features of the location that may make some locations more susceptible to alien species establishing and leaving a population than others. And the problem that we have in trying to uh, tease all these effects apart is that these are very complicated. So there's lots of different traits that we might expect uh, to affect the probability that the species will leave a founding population or not. And the environment is potentially even more complicated than that. So when we think about features of locations, those features can be the abiotic or the biotic environment. They can be absolute features of the environment or they can be features relative to the species that you're putting in there. So a species that's good, uh, uh, an environment that's good for one species may be bad for another species. You also get lots of spatial and temporal variation uh, in the environment. So the time that you're putting species in uh, will also matter. And this variation can be long-term or it can be short-term. Uh, and also we have natural environmental variation and increasingly we have anthropogenic impacts too. So what we need uh, to do is to try and take all of these effects into account. And we have further complications in that the, the species being introduced are not random, so we get phylogenetic autocorrelation. The locations are not random, so we get spatial autocorrelation. And then we have to take into account these idiosyncrasies of the introduction event as well. So we have to take into account particularly propagule pressure, because that will affect um, our understanding of the um, establishment process. So this is a, a very complicated analysis, and it's one that um, my group, led by Dave Redding, um, has just uh, 
completed for birds, so this was published last week, um, and it's a general global analysis of, in, of the establishment of bird introduction events around the world. So the best model here we're looking at is, is almost 2,000 introduction events of species to different locations around the world, taking into account factors of the environment of the species uh, and the numbers of individuals introduced. So overall, for our models, what we find is that characteristics of the location together explain the most variation in bird establishment probability worldwide. However, there are still big effects of species traits, and there are still big effects of uh, idiosyncrasies of the introduction event. When we break this, uh, this down into smaller chunks, what we see is that there's a big effect here of propagule pressure. So you need to know the founding population size um, to understand the establishment process. There are also big effects of uh, species traits, so life history uh, really matters. Uh, but there are uh, big effects of anthropogenic uh, environmental uh, effects, and particularly the match of species to the environment where you're introducing them. So I'm just going to break this down and focus on some of the, the features of the environment that really matter, because we're considering sort of islands versus other regions. So the first thing to note is that there's actually not a, an island effect per se. So there's no evidence that islands are improving our model over other features uh, that we're putting in. However, we do see some, um, some interesting environmental effects. So for example, uh, environmental match really matters. So if you put an, a species into an area where the environment is very different to what it experiences in its native range, it's going to fail. Uh, interestingly, what we see is, is kind of a hump-shaped effect of uh, native species richness. So if you have few similar uh, native bird species in an environment, uh, failure rate is, is quite high, but that, uh, then you're more likely to succeed if you have a few similar species, but then if you have lots, your failure rate drops. So this suggests that um, an environment that's um, good for uh, relatives of that species is gonna be quite good for the alien, but if you've got too many of those um, native uh, similar native species, then that increases the probability of failure rate. So it's kind of like Elton was half right there. What we also see is that um, the more uh, alien taxa that are already established in an area at the time of introduction, the more likely that bird is to succeed. So the more alien species that are getting in, the more likely you are to get more, essentially, which is, has certain features of what we might call invasion or meltdown. The more aliens you're adding to the environment, the more aliens you're going to get. Uh, and then interestingly, we have uh, this uh, weather anomaly here. So if there was a big storm in the introduction area in the decade after the species was introduced, that increases the probability that, that population will fail. So we know that big storms can have uh, effects on native species uh, persistence, but they also have effects on um, alien species persistence as well. So overall, then, if we consider these components of alien species richness, our model suggests this should be a function of colonization pressure, of propagule pressure, of lineage survival. Propagule pressure isn't higher on islands. Um, island location doesn't predict establishment success per se, at least in the uh, absence of the, um, in the presence of those other variables, uh, which may characterize island environments. However, colonization pressure is a strong predictor of alien richness, and there is some evidence, at least, that colonization pressure is higher on islands. So this may explain why uh, we think of islands as uh, susceptible to invasion. But before we um, finish the talk, let's actually go back to the uh, original uh, premise uh, of the talk, which is that islands uh, do actually have more alien species uh, than continental regions. And so that seems not to be an unreasonable question are islands richer in alien species than mainlands? And actually, if you think about it in island by, ge by geographic terms, um, that seems unlikely. So here we have a cartoon of um, how native species richness varies with area. Uh, this is um, a, a picture first drawn by Mike Rosenzweig. Um, so here we have richness against area. So what we tend to see is that the number of species increases with area. So uh, large, uh, biogeographic regions have more species than small biogeographic regions. Within those regions, larger areas have more species than smaller areas. And then islands um, off those um, provinces tend to have uh, fewer 
uh, alien species than the mainlands, but larger islands have more, alien, uh, more native species than smaller islands. So the fact that larger areas tend to have more species would suggest that islands shouldn't have more alien species than, than continents. If we look at uh, the comparison between uh, native and alien species richness, so this is a study recently published by uh, Bicer and Lee. Uh, they uh, collected data on studies of alien and native species richness where the study had, had assessed the species area relationship for native species and alien species across the same set, for the same taxa, across the same set of locations. Uh, and what we see here is a couple of things. So um, the thick slopes are for plants. So what we see is that there's more species of plants in areas of, um, than there are animals, which probably tells you something about the sorts of animal taxa that are being studied um, in this. What we see is that uh, the slopes for native species lie above the slopes for alien species. So in general, there are more native species in an area than there are alien species, which is perhaps a small piece of good news. Um, however, what we see is that the slopes of those relationships are essentially the same for uh, alien species and for native species for these different groups. So the animal slopes are the same and the plant slopes are the same. So it would seem that there's something um, about this, uh, about the effect of area on species richness that is having a similar effect for um, aliens and for natives. So then a fundamental question is, well, are there then more alien species on islands than on mainlands? And actually, when you go to the literature and look, it's very hard to find any studies that really show that there are more alien species on, an, on islands than there are on, on continents. What we do see a lot is that there are more alien species on islands for a given area. So, you know, 10 square kilometers on a, of an island will tend to have more alien species than uh, 10 square kilometers uh, of a continent. But overall, it's very difficult to find studies that um, will tell you that uh, continents have more alien species than islands. And you kind of expect that, really, if you think about it, because, you know, continents are uh, much larger. But what we can do is we can then fit our uh, curves for uh, alien species into uh, Rosenzweig's uh, model for native species. So what we tend to find here, then, is that, um, so on islands, alien species, the slope is the same as for uh, natives, but it falls below it. Uh, the slopes are the same uh, for uh, 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 alien and native species on um, continents. However, the slopes for islands tend to fall above the slopes for uh, continents for aliens, so you get more alien species per area on islands than on mainlands. Uh, the slopes are different on islands and mainlands, but the intercepts are the same. So essentially, islands seem to be uh, more invaded because they have they're smaller areas, so they have more species per area. But when you look over continents as a whole, um, then those continents do have more um, alien species than islands because there's much more area for those species to be. So in conclusion then, um, alien invasions are one of the primary ways that humans are changing the natural world. Uh, they're ongoing, they're accelerating, they concern almost all taxa, almost all parts of the world have alien species. Islands seem to be particularly uh, susceptible. Um, so that's not down to propagule pressure. It's not down to them being islands per se, although there may well be features of the environment that uh, promote establishment success of aliens. For example, islands may tend to be more similar to uh, the natural uh, environmental conditions of more native species. What we do know is that colonization pressure really matters. Uh, so the number of, it, of species you introduce determines the number of species you get. But there's not more of those per se on islands, although there are more per unit area. So what we have ultimately then is, is this sort of process going on. So we have uh, some pool of uh, native species that differ in their abundance and their distribution. Uh, people are moving some of those species to different areas. And what they tend to do is they tend to introduce more species to larger areas than to smaller areas. Uh, of those species that are introduced, then there is a process of establishment, uh, which depends on the numbers of individuals that you're introducing. So at small numbers introduced, failure happens a lot by chance. But once you get beyond uh, that, um, that boundary, uh, then at this level, 
establishment is independent of the number introduced. It then depends on these combination of the of characteristics of the species and the location. And this process in all leads to some number of species being established, uh, which also is then uh, dependent on uh, the area of the, island, of the location. So islands have more aliens per unit area, but main, uh, mainlands have more air, uh, aliens in total because they have more area. So I'd just like to finish up by acknowledging all of my co-authors um, on, on this work. Uh, so Dave Redding, who uh, did the amazing models of uh, alien species uh, establishment success across islands. Phil Cassie, Julie Lockwood, and Richard Duncan, who I've worked with for many years. Ellie Dyer, who put all of the data together. Uh, Alex Pigott who, uh, Pigott, who worked with me on the species richness model, and Hanno Siebens, uh, who collated the amazing data set of alien species um, establishment worldwide. And thank you very much for your attention. And I'm very happy to take questions. Jens Rover, University of Hamburg. Um, I don't have really solid data on uh, plant uh, introductions, but I have 30 years of leading student excursions uh, to our native flora, and uh, from that I have the impression uh, that um, environmental change might play a role. And that is, um, most of our, our ornamental plants have been around uh, since the mid of the 19th century in Central Europe, and they, there was never any recruitment in most of the species until, let's say, the end of the 20th century. And over the past 30 years, we have seen a dramatic increase of uh, species becoming established that had been there for decades but never established before. Well, how do you, what do you think that the environmental change plays a big role in, um, in the future in introductions of species? Yes, yeah, so, I mean, environmental change, I think, um, is important. It's just a question of exactly how that environmental change is then impacting on your um, alien species establishment and richness. So I think one of the problems we have for plants is that um, your propagules, in a sense, are cryptic. Um, so, you know, for birds, we see those individuals and they're introduced and it's very obvious. And for plants, you know, you have a situation where potentially you have, you know, an increase in seeds coming in for various reasons, you know, things going into gardens, you know, all sorts of reasons why you might be getting increasing levels of propagule pressure um, going in, which, which may be important. So for birds, at least, we do know that environmental change um, matters. Um, we had various um, metrics of environmental change in our um, establishment model, for example, and the one that you know seems to be important is how many aliens you have in there. Interestingly, um, if you had a lot of um, habitat change in the decade leading up to the introduction, then that tends to um, reduce the probability that an introduced bird there will fail. Um, so it's it's not necessarily a straightforward process. This is birds, and I would hate to say that birds are, you know, the same as everything else, and they're going to give the answers for everything. Um, plants, they're just weird, so I, you know, I, I find it very difficult to, to comment on what they do. Thank you. David Gwyn Evans, Uh One of the things you mentioned is that storms decrease the chance of birds surviving. Uh, I suspect that's the opposite for plants and that storms would actually increase the chance of aliens uh, coming into the area and uh, establishing. Um, and I think this has important implications and I wish to first echo what was just said there about um, certainly in, in the Table Mountain area in the last decade, we've seen an incredible increase in the number of invasive alien plant species that have suddenly taken off. And that's presumably 
linked to uh, temperature. But then regarding climate change and the number of storms uh, hitting mainland America, I think there's an incredible opportunity to actually study that because many of those areas haven't seen storms. And so we could see the aliens now and then in 10 years, 20 years, see what happens. Any thoughts there? Yeah, no, that's a, that's a really good point, actually. Um, you know, again, I mean, plants are, you know, special in having these um, life stages that are incredibly resistant. And, you know, so when, when you know, for birds, if a storm comes through, uh, you know, we know from native species, um, you know, we worry about species that only have populations on one small island because if a storm comes through there's a fair chance that it may knock out that entire population as you say for plants it's going to be different because those individuals there are, in, there are individuals that are not going to be knocked out because they're in the seed bank or whatever and then that environmental change potentially has a knock-on consequence um, you introduced the um, the notion of climate change and that is certainly going to be important so for birds um, I didn't show it, but there's kind of a, like a Goldilocks effect where like not too hot or not too cold uh, increases your probability of success. So that may affect, suggest that as the temperature rises, you know, you may move species out of that Goldilocks zone. However, as global temperatures generally increase, you're going to see more areas that match the environment of more species simply because there are more species in the tropics and the more tropical other areas become, the more, you know, fitting the environment is going to be. So we, we probably should be concerned about um, climate, um, climate change for that reason. Um, the idea of, of studying uh, impacts in areas after storms have gone through is, is a really interesting one. Um, and I hadn't, yeah, I hadn't thought about it in terms of plants being different from animals, but yeah, there's a clear way in which they would be. Um, hi, Tim. Uh, hi. This is Nitya Mohanty from uh, Stellenbosch University. I wanted to ask you, uh, you did touch upon the concept of invasional meltdown for your bird data. But how do you see your general model of alien, uh, alien species richness, uh, the equation in the context of invasional meltdown? Do you think that the line, uh, rather than going straight, uh, the linear inc increase in alien species richness with colonization pressure, it can have uh, other shapes? Do you think that uh, S will be also related to also affect uh, P, the establishment uh, potential? Yeah, no, that's a really good point. I mean, the, the, that straight line um, is kind of worrying. Um, although it makes sense in terms of just, yeah, you know, if, if you want to get lots of alien species in an area, then just introduce lots of species. I mean, it, you know, that makes good logical sense. So, you know, our paper, we don't um, go into great detail in terms of modeling uh, the potential interactions between those components. So we would certainly expect there to be interactions between the number of species you introduce and the num numbers of individuals, um, and there's potentially then also interactions, as you say, between the probability that those, um, that those introduced species leave um, surviving lineages. So the clear next step is then, at the moment we just say, sort of all else being equal and in isolation, this is what we expect. Um, and then, you know, there's a, there's a pa couple of paragraphs in the paper um, th uh, hypothesizing about what some of the interactions might be, but there's a clear opportunity there to um, explore interactions amongst the different components of that model and see what effects those, those would have. Um, it seems to me highly unlikely that that is just going to be a straight line going on forever, um, but exactly how that, um, that line would bend um, is not clear at this point. And just as a corollary, do you think it can be a good null model to test invasional meltdown? Uh... Um, so invasional, yeah, so potentially. Um, so invasional meltdown, I tend to think about it more in terms of cross uh, taxa. So if you're seeing that same model, you know, that same line for all the different taxa, then yeah, that's, that's going to be a worry because, you know, if storms are affecting the number of uh, plant species are invading, that potentially has knock-on effects for the likelihood that other taxa are going to invade and then it all just builds up. Um, so yeah, I think that's, that's something we need to think about. Um, Roger Kitchen, Griffith Uni, Australia. Um, I wanted to address the point you made that there was a correlation between the number of alien species in an area and the number of native species in an mm. area. Now, the areas I know well from your map up there, it seems to me that, yes, that may be true, but the number of alien species in an area, and supporting Elton here in a way, 
it reflects the degree of anthropogenic environmental modification that mm -hmm. has gone on. So for birds in Australia, for instance, if you get into undamaged ecosystems, of which there are, are many, fortunately, uh, you seldom see an alien bird. Mm. Uh, but on the areas that have been cleared, agriculturalized in a semi-European way, that's where the aliens are. Yeah. And it can often happen on a spatial scale of a kilometer or less. Yeah. Um, sadly, the same is not true for predatory mammals. Mm -hmm. Have you any comment on the, yeah. the importance of mo environmental modification? Yeah, so um, two things. Uh, one is, um, so that's a relatively crude, so we're, we're modeling on a sort of 100 by 100 kilometer um, grid square there, so that's, that's one thing. The other thing is that, so that, that effect of, that rich get richer effect is, is all else being equal. So this is accounting for the fact that you're getting, more, you're getting more species introduced to certain areas. So in Australia, you know, you've got, um, and again, just, you know, I know the birds, you've got lots of lovely aliens sort of down the east coast where all the people are, where the ports are, where, you know, people were introducing things in the Victorian acclimatization societies. Forest cleared, so all those effects are, are potentially interacting. So, but when you do the modeling and you have, um, you know, although I didn't show it, we've got data on, you know, environmental um, factors in that model and they just fall out. Um, interestingly, if you don't have colonization pressure in, so if you take that factor out, then the abiotic environment does, um, does become important. So that, um, so that a, a abiotic effect is, is kind of subsumed by the colonization pressure effect, as it were. Um, and so if you don't know how many species you're introducing, you actually see a different best model that implies that the abiotic environment is more important than the biotic. If you include the number of introduced, then it suggests that the biotic is more important than the abiotic. Anna Traviset from the Balearic Islands. I have a curiosity. Well, I haven't read your nature paper yet. Well, I mean, honestly, I'm, I'm very upset. <laughs> <laughs> I, I wonder whether there are any differences between um, continental islands and oceanic islands, if you have... Uh, yeah, no, no, uh, there isn't. So that, that is also, that's another... So we, we put islands in in a couple of ways, so just islands versus continents, and then different sorts of uh, land type, which includes oceanic and, and yeah. So, yeah, so that doesn't explain variation over and above the other features of the model, although the, some of those features that do explain variation you know, are potentially things that could differ or do differ between um, sort of oceanic and, and continental islands. Uh, thank you. <coughs> so I was wondering if you can differentiate between intentional introductions and uh, accidental introductions, because with birds, it's the, the intentional introductions, especially in New Zealand, for example, or in the United States, are playing a big role, right? So can you take that into consideration within your model, or how is that to do with? Yeah, so for birds, we, um, for many of those introductions, we can distinguish whether they were deliberate or intentional. What you tend to find is that um, that's kind of highly correlated with many other features because um, those processes are not random. So we tend to think of, you know, for birds, we actually tend to think of a lot of the introductions being deliberate and there were acclimatization societies deliberately set up to introduce species. And so that's, that explains, so birds show this up, up surge in uh, established populations in the second half of the 19th century, and that's because people were introducing deliberately. They also saw the upsurge in the second half of the 20th century, and that's very much driven by accidental introductions. But those accidental introductions then have different features in terms of the location, the species, the propagule pressure, and so all of those factors tend to confound that, um, that comparison between uh, deliberate and accidental. So we could actually... Um, we could actually just look specifically to see if there are differences between those, you know, those two categories. Uh, but in terms of the models, then I uh, think that's all going to be subsumed by these other factors that um, that change in those um, because accidental and deliberate introductions have all, all sorts of other different features as well. I have a question about the the relationship between the number of successful alien species that are introduced and the species richness of the native birds. Mm -hmm. 
when you use, uh, where do you get the numbers for the species richness of native birds? If you, if you think of a place like the Hawaiian Islands, many of the native species were extinct or rare before the alien species mm -hmm. arrived. Is it the, the original species richness of the habitat that is most important, or is it how many birds are actually, how many species of birds are actually there when the aliens are introduced? Yeah, that's a good question, actually. Um, I suspect we are um, using extant uh, native species. So for s islands, yeah, that's, um, that's a big issue. I mean, that... <laughs> so, most, so most of the areas that we analyze are not going to be islands where um, there have been lots of extinctions anyway. Um, but yeah, that's a good point, something I, sh I should probably have a think about. Thank you for this very interesting talk. Gerard Rocamora from Seychelles. Um, you, you've been uh, saying that there is not more invasive species per se on islands, although there, there are more per, per, per hectare, per, yeah. per, per area. But have you looked into the percentages? Sorry. I mean, the percentage of oh. um, aliens you know, uh, versus uh, the natives, because I think the results might be different. Yeah, no, you're absolutely right. So um, the percentage of alien species on islands um, is generally higher than on, um, on continental mainlands. Um, it's, yeah, I mean, it's very variable across groups and across taxa. There are some areas, even though those sort of average slopes for alien uh, species area relationships are below the natives, there are, other er there are some areas where they're above them um, so there's a fair amount of variation in there, but you're absolutely right, the percentage will be higher. Um, hello, I'm uh, Wilfredo Falcon from uh, Puerto Rico. I have a follow-up question uh, regarding the Hawaiian um, mm -hmm. case. So we have um, in Puerto Rico one extant uh, species, an Amazona, which is um, endangered, and we used to have a parakeet. And now we have, I think, um, around 40 um, mm -hmm. citizen species in Puerto Rico, from which about 12 are established. And um, I haven't had the pleasure of reading the Duncan's uh, et al's paper, but how precise and quantitative um, does the data has to be to test um, the model in islands? Because we have a lot of um, anecdotal information and not a lot of, a lot of uh, quantitative data on the introductions. And a separate question related is, um, so you mentioned heterogeneity in the model. Um, yeah. Does it consider, um, uh, not spatial, but um, time uh, heterogeneity? Yeah, so potentially that heterogeneity could be, um, you know, variation in space or in time. Uh, you've actually hit on a really good um, question, which is how we actually then go and test our model. And this was something that um, the reviewers um, for that paper um, suggested, and we don't yet have a good answer <laughs> to that question. So we sort of skirted around it a bit in our revisions. But um, yeah, I'm certainly very open to uh, any suggestions or discussion about um, how we might um, put real data uh, into that model to uh, do some validation. Great, thank you very much. Thank you.